Hello YouTube, this is the final video of the build series. I want to start by thanking everyone for following along and the feedback provided. In the last video, we got the CAN network configured and running. I have mixed feelings. It wasn't as hard as I thought, but can see how it could go terribly wrong for someone else. Let's continue by checking the wiring one last time. Even with CAN bus, there's a lot of wires, so make sure everything is good and tight. I also suggest not installing the raceway covers until you confirm everything is working. Power it up and watch for any smoke or sparks. There should be a green light on the 24 volt PSU and three red lights on the octopus. This pro version has an audible alarm if there is a short circuit. The Pi has both a red and green light. Finally, the EBB36 board also has a green light. Other problems won't appear until we start the configuration. Until then, you may also see errors in mainsail. Unlike setting up Canvas, the software configuration is better documented and more straightforward. Load the printer.cfg or config file, which by default has these few lines. If not done already, add the Canvas UUIDs from the last video. The top MCU entry refers to the octopus and you can comment out the serial ID with a hashtag. This practice preserves original settings for troubleshooting. For CAN bus setups, add a separate MCU entry below for the EBB board. Watch your formatting and don't add extra spaces where they don't belong. There are online templates for both boards, which prevent us from reinventing the wheel. I started with the EBB36 template. Copy and paste this into your existing config file. Every pin assignment for this board uses the EBB CAN identifier from earlier. This is case sensitive, so if you forget to capitalize the C in EBB CAN, it won't work. Anytime you see an exclamation mark, that is to invert a setting, such as the motor direction. This will fix some wiring mistakes without having to take things apart. Not all entries apply to my setup, such as the MAX31865, which is commented out. You may also need to swap some assignments. In my case, the high end and part cooling fans. Repeat by pasting the longer octopus template up top. Now you can remove duplicate entries, such as the hot end fans already assigned by the CAN board. Likewise, you may need to copy over settings missing from the EBB section. If you are working in smaller chunks, know that certain sections have to be configured all at once. For example, you can't just add AB motors without the Z. Trying to save that will throw an error after restart, and it will specify where the mistake is. I deleted entries that don't apply to my build, such as references to the 250 and 350 printers. This makes the file less cluttered. Otherwise, they did a great job leaving hints on what to use based on different setups. Next are the initial startup checks, which are also well documented. Refer to this website in case I missed something. First set of checks is simply making sure the hardware is working correctly. Thermistors are tested at idle and with a low temperature ramp up. The bottom fan should kick on when testing the high end heater. Make sure it's blowing air in the right direction. All commands are run from the terminal window. I start with the stepper buzz command, which oscillates the motors. This identifies any that are DOA or rotating backwards. If you look closely at the belt, it should move around one millimeter each way. The end stops must work before running a homing routine. Test each one individually with the query end stops command which can identify mechanical or electrical issues. The documentation says the home X with a G28X command. If you forget to type the letter X, it will attempt to home all three axes. Unless you already install your Z end stop in the right location, it will crash the tool head. Don't ask how I know. A safer bet is to use the main sail tool head buttons to home X and Y. If it starts moving in the wrong direction, the emergency stop button is your friend. With X and Y home, the tool head should be in the right corner, and mainsail will show the location numbers. Copy and paste these coordinates into the config under the safe Z home entry. My 00, 0 location is not quite ideal. This is likely due to the Y and stop relocate, sacrificing some space front to back. I'll have to revisit this later, as it might just be a trade-off to live with. Run G28 or click home all to make sure everything is correct. The query probe command checks the inductive probe. When far away from the bed, it should say open and not triggered. It was here that I found out I plugged my connector on the wrong pins. 
I forgot the blue wire is ground, and black is signal with a VAT85 diode. Luckily, nothing got fried. I simply moved the connector one pin over and it worked fine. The probe accuracy command brings back a consistent reading and favorable standard deviation. But that's because the nozzle touches the bed before triggering. I had to disassemble the stealth burner and lower the probe, which is set at 6mm by default. It's trial and error, and a loose nozzle doesn't help. I finally set it to where the Omron sticker aligns with the X carriage bottom. I run the PID tune, which calibrates the hot end and bed heater with a 10 minute routine. These settings are saved to the bottom of the config file. It comments out the duplicate entry in the main body, so don't uncomment those or you'll have conflicting settings. FYI, the save config command creates date stamp backups in case something goes horribly wrong. While still warm, tighten down the heater screw and nozzle. Be careful as the allen keys get hot really fast. Once again, don't ask how I know. The quad gantry level uses the inductive probe to take corner readings and make Z adjustments. This squares the gantry with the bed. For Z adjustment, remember to run another G28 command after the gantry leveling. Set X and Y to 150, which centers the tool head. Lower it until you feel slight resistance on a piece of paper. You need to make micro adjustments and Clipper expects this done when cold. Accept and save the change, which updates the Z end stop position in the config. Extruder calibration. I marked the filament 120mm from the entrance and feed 100mm using mainsail. Based on what actually went through, we can update the rotation distance setting. My first attempt was low. The formula is actual amount extruded, in this case 65mm divided by the expected amount of 100. You multiply that with the existing rotation distance, which provides the updated number. I ran more filament through and it was perfect. Download and set up your slicer. I am using Super Slicer with the default Voron 2.4 profile. The only change was on the PET filament profile to use higher temps for the hot end and bed. I ran my first print and spaghetti. This is good as it shows the dedication needed to build and tune these machines. Even after taking my time, the first run was a complete failure. Best part is I don't even know what went wrong, so I called it a night. You don't want to rush and make too many changes at once or you won't know what fixed what problem. Day two, and after some research, I reduced the amperage of the extruder. It was apparently set too high for a pancake motor. The formula is peak amp rating multiplied by 0.707. That is the max setting, so start lower and only increase as needed. Afterwards, I reran the extruder calibration. It still had first layer adhesion issues, so I looked into Super Slicer calibration prints. I realized it defaulted to a 0.05 layer height, which was probably pushing too much filament. I switched this to 0.2, but it did not solve the problem. Even after multiple Z offset calibrations, it keeps leaving the nozzle slightly too high. I tried adjusting Z height on the fly while printing and saving it as a permanent change. This means the config file has separate Z end stop position and offset entries. I felt like they were working against each other. Day three, and after more research, I'm rechecking everything. I didn't flush cut the Z end stop pin, meaning the surface was jagged and threw different readings while being homed. This set screw had Loctite and stripped before it even budged. That is why Threadlocker is used on motor set screws. I disassembled the end stop to grind the pin flat, which wasted time. Cut this right the first time, folks. Next, I'm checking the anti-squish, which was not in the manual. I did not do this and had to take stealth burner apart again. Here's some footage on the quality of the EBB36 connectors. Just know that this one won't come out without pliers, which is ridiculous. While we have this off, might as well have some fun. Here's some aviation nerd humor. It can be washed off and I'm probably going to replace the top fan eventually due to excessive noise. For the anti-squish adjustment, I'm going to link a video below. It appears the way I had it, the 50 toothed gear was binding. With the tension knob two thirds tight, loosen the anti-squish screw just until the gear no longer binds. The second part is adjusting the tension knob until you can't pull the filament out by hand. I put everything back together. This time, I ran the extrusion test using a 1mm feed rate per second instead of 5. This allows easier observation should anything go wrong as it extrudes. Blobs, hiccups, etc. 
You can also test this cold by removing the bottom tool cartridge. I erased both Z end stop position and offset entries from the config. Next, I reran the Z end stop calibration. When I did the sanity check, G0, Z0 is still off. Z0 should have the nozzle touching the bed, but it happens to be the perfect height for a paper test. Perhaps they changed something and didn't update the web documentation. The second calibration print looks better, but now seems to have the opposite problem of the nozzle being slightly too close. I'll take it. Day 4. I decide to print out some test squares from Ellis's first layer squish guide. Without changing anything from the day before, it came out fine without any live Z adjustment. Therefore, I proceeded to printing the test cube. I modified the print start macro to park the tool head higher from 20 to 150 millimeters. This provides better clearance to clean filament from the nozzle during heat up. While printing, I noticed a hall light flickering, which concerned me. Underneath the printer, I saw the SSR and octopus lights flashing in the same pattern. I researched for hours, thinking it was bad wiring. It turns out that's just how these heaters work with PID. In config, you add this line under the heater bed depending where you live. Success for the most part. The hall light still has some visual quirks, but it's not seizure flashing like before. Even better, the lights on my SSR and Octopus are now solid. I wish this was better documented as it could be quite scary to the uninformed. The cube is finished and the main build is complete. We now know that everything is fundamentally working. However, it isn't over because it needs tuning. Otherwise, this cube won't be any better looking than the one off my existing printer. Likewise, the machine itself needs more adjustments. For example, the LED colors are mismatched because I don't have the code to control them individually yet. It takes time and it's fine because the printer needs time to break in. Belts will stretch, screws need to be retightened. You are instructed to celebrate the accomplishment with a bowl of cereal. However, it's late at night, so here's an alternative which I'm sure many will agree with. If you want, you can post a video of your printer in action and request a serial number. I will link my current config file down below as a reference. Since this is the last video of the series, I will also include a file containing all my video notes. It has tips and lessons learned for each section of the build. In closing, I thank you again for watching. I also want to thank the Voron community for their time and contributions, so absolute beginners like me can build something so awesome. I finished a build without asking a single question on Discord or Facebook, but don't hesitate to reach out for help. This is not to brag, but show that it is possible for an average person to complete. Here's a quote from the Voron website. We build space shuttles with gardening tools so anyone can have a space shuttle of their own. I hope these videos helped someone out there and did the community justice. Subscribe for future update videos on mods, tuning, and lessons learned. Until then, see you all next time.